my gentle and of course very modern apes, I'm not gonna beat around the bush with you. Today we are covering, yet again, one of my favorite topics to talk about on this channel. Five, four, three, two, one! Yeah, that's right, we're suckling from that teat again. But what you have to understand is that I'm a channel that goes over debunking pseudoscience, right? And that includes young Earth creationism. In fact, a lot of the times, that's what we focus on here. And seeing them try to solve this problem over and over and over again unsuccessfully is an endless amount of content for me. I get to cover it every time. Today we'll be visiting some familiar characters up to their old tricks again, trying to posit that they've in fact solved the heat problem, I guess treating the problem like it was simply unsolved instead of one that is unsolvable. I made like three videos on this subsequently in a row and they still don't get it. They of course is the Standing for Truth channel. Yeah. We're covering them again. I just can't help myself. I know that I made this, and that I made this, and that I made this. But what do you want me to do? Stop? Don't answer that. Okay, but who's the real bad guy here? Me for being awful, cringy, embarrassing, having no class, no tact, no shame. Or you or remembering anything I've ever done. Some background for those of you who might be new. Standing for Truth is a YouTube channel slash ministry, and they strongly promote young earth creationism here on the internet. It is helmed by Donald Deals, the eponymous Standing for Truth himself, as well as an additional cast of quirky characters. By quirky, I mean the majority of the co-hosts and guests on the channel range from being unlikable to criminal. Donnie is actually the most tolerable of all of them, I think, and he actually gets some pretty big names in Young Earth Creationism to come on his channel, including like Jason Lyle or Robert Carter, as well as some less well-known names who are far funnier and fill me with a sense of whimsy. Tube? I, I don't know when. You've charmed me. You might be out there wondering what is Young Earth Creationism, and I'm happy to answer that for you. It is, after all, what I do. Young Earth Creationism is the typically here in the West evangelical Christian belief that the Earth was created more or less in its present state approximately 6,000 years ago, and that the entire geologic column, including all of the fossils within it, the radiometric dates, the impact events, etc., 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 all of that was formed during the real-life event of Noah's Ark, in which God punishes the Earth and wipes it clean, killing everything on the surface except for Noah and two of every kind of critter, his family as well, uh, that are safe on a big wooden boat while a global flood basically soft resets the planet. So the timeline more or less is 6,000 years ago, creation ex nihilo from nothing, followed by 4,400 years ago, give or take, a big global flood, and then the entirety of the geologic column from the Cambrian to the Cretaceous and sometimes like into the Cenozoic was created during that event, the single one year long Noah's flood event. We'll get there. And then after that, Noah and his family get off of the ark along with two of every kind of critter and subsequently repopulate the planet. Now, from a conventionally scientific standpoint, this is absolutely bonkers. There is no evidence or support for any of it. We have zero notice, zero implication, zero support for a globe-spanning flood that is responsible for the entirety of the geologic column. Geology, paleontology, chemistry, paleoecology, paleoanthropology, physics, astronomy, pick any field and I promise you it precludes a global flood and I have spent a long time here on YouTube explaining the minutia of why that is the case. But in all that time, there is one argument that I think is the simplest and most fun when it comes to knocking over the global flood as an idea. I've stated before that I feel that it's actually a conversation ender with regard to young earth creationism, and it is, of course, the heat problem. You can find a seriously in-depth look at the heat problem here, and then also here, and also here. But the long story short of it is this. So creationists want to suppose that Noah's Ark and Noah's Flood is responsible for the entirety of the geologic column. And depending on the creationist you're talking to, it might be 4.5 billion years worth of the geologic column, or just 500 million years worth of the geologic column. The latter spanning from the Cambrian to the Cretaceous, or potentially even into the Cenozoic, which would boost 
reduced it to like 550 million years worth of just events. And when I say events, I mean every impact event, every mass extinction, all of the radioactive decay, all of the rock formation, the movement of the continents from supercontinent to separate continents and back again, all of that has to be explained during the year-long event of Noah's Flood because that is the event that is supposed to be responsible for the geologic column and thus everything recorded within it. They do this so they can basically say that what appears to be just a ton of time is actually a very small amount of time and just a very catastrophic event. They're trying to cram 4.5 billion to 500 million years worth of processes into a single year. Obviously, this entire scenario runs contra to the very ancient age of the Earth and an actualistic perspective provided by conventional science, which states that the Earth is approximately 4.5 billion years old. This is done using radiometric dating, and an interesting little tidbit about this is that most young Earth creationists, and indeed the ones that work for like Answers in Genesis and the like, will agree that the radiometric dates that we pull from a lot of these rock samples do appear to be legitimate indicators of radioactive decay, and this is important. All radiometric dating is, is an appeal to very basic laws in physics, more specifically the radioactive decay law. It works a little something like this. You take a sample of rock, and in that rock you are going to have elements, and specifically radioactive isotopes. Some of these isotopes are extremely stable, and some of them are not stable at all. And unstable radioactive isotopes will spontaneously decay into a more stable daughter product at a known rate. The amount of time that it takes for half of the amount of that parent material to decay into its daughter product is its known half-life. And we know half-lives are consistent and constant because we have tested this over and over and over again in the lab and using observation in natural environments. So let's say we have a rock formed with uranium-238 in it. Uranium-238 is unstable and will decay into lead-206 after 4.5 billion years. If you were present at the formation of this rock example and then you waited 4.5 billion years and came back, it would be half uranium-238 and half lead-206. If you would come back another 4.5 billion years later, half of that remaining uranium-238 will have decayed into lead-206 and so on and so forth. So what we can do then is look at any rock and look at the ratio of parent to daughter radioactive isotopes of known decay chains and then take that back in time to see when the rock actually formed. This is called absolute dating and it is extremely useful to us in the modern era because we use it to find fossil fuels in a process called basin modeling. Now you might be thinking, okay, well, that's great that we know how old the earth is, but like, what does this have to do with the heat problem? Everything. Because when radioisotopes decay, they release heat. Not that much, but they release a little bit of heat every time these this decay actually occurs, regardless of the series that we're looking at. Every year, we can actually measure the amount of heat that is put off like due to this decay like across the Earth or in isolation in labs for specific elements, specific decay chains, what have you. That's not a problem for conventional science because it's only a little bit every year. But what happens if you take 4.5 billion years worth of decay, or just 500 million years worth of decay, like the heat from that decay, and cram it into a single year? You get the vaporization of the granitic crust of the Earth several dozen times over, something that I hope I don't need to tell you a wooden boat would not survive. To put this into actual numbers, joules if you will, this is 1.86 times 10 raised 29 joules for 500 million years worth of decay. This is the equivalent of setting off 44 hydrogen bombs in every cubic kilometer of the planet. And if we up it to 4.5 billion years, it's 1.68 times 10 raised 30 joules. 402 hydrogen bombs for every cubic kilometer. For the record, to boil the oceans, you need 5.6 times 10 raised 26 joules of energy, and to vaporize it completely, you need 3.7 times 10 raised 27 joules. So that's just the nuclear decay. You can add things like the lithification of limestone, the hardening of all of the magma that we have to explain in the geologic column, all of the impact events and the friction of the continents as they go from Pangaea to the current positioning or Rodinia to separating out and then Pangaea to current positioning. Like none of this works. It's an obscene amount of heat. 
What's interesting is that a lot of those numbers come from young Earth creationists who are basically saying, we have a problem. And kudos to them for admitting it, right? Answers in Genesis has an entire thermal problems with the Genesis Flood series where they go through each of these major sources of heat and are like, uh, we're working on it, we're trying to make it work. Um, but it's probably going to end up being miraculous. The miracles door has been propped open for young Earth creationists to solve their heat problem slash radiometric dates problem for quite some time, like since the rate team, but that has been held up to present. The vast majority of the professionals are putting their hands up and saying either we don't know what we're going to do or the solution is probably going to be miraculous or sometimes they'll appeal to like future physics that will be discovered which like okay but that's at present miraculous that's a miraculous appeal. I think the game is over the second you admit that because you're no longer talking about science you're talking about like just flat out creationism right like you can appeal to miracles all day long but your idea is no longer even in the bulk or even in the same like tri-state area as science or scientific investigation and your attempts at justifying young earth creationism using science are like officially taken behind the barn and shot i think this is why the youtube creationists like the standing for truth channel are so reticent to just say that it's miraculous and as a result they have touted to have solved the heat problem like over and over and over again for the past several years. And each time they've proposed a solution, it has fallen flat on its face in an embarrassing fashion. Sometimes they'll even go back to previous solutions, quote unquote, that have already been debunked. So like for instance, Standing for Truth will say, what about hypercanes, big global hypercanes that can shoot all of the heat into space or something like that. Uh, and then Jordan, friend of the channel, did the math for that and was like, yeah, that's gonna get rid of like less than 1% of the heat, it's not going to work. Even if you had a hypercane that spanned the entire globe, you're not going to get rid of even a percent of the heat. And so Donnie was like, okay, crap. So he, he kind of didn't use the hypercane thing for a while. And then like he comes back and, and suggests it again, like years later, like, oh, but what about the hypercanes? It's like, we've already been over this, dude. Like we've already talked about it. It doesn't work. Can I pray for you? Perfect. Dear God, I thank you for my man right here. I know that he's been making some very bad decisions and he's in a season of stupidity, but you can pull him out of this and use him a little bit. I know sometimes I reuse memes on this channel, but sometimes I stumble across one, like a, an Instagram clip or a TikTok or something like that, and I'm like, it's just too perfect not to use over and over and over again. It's always applicable to this particular group of people. So you might see some of that today. The way I see it, if they can repeat the same arguments, I can repeat at least some of the same jokes. I drew a clip from my previous video on the subject where I scroll through some of the many videos that Donnie has released titled like Heat Problem Annihilated or End Game for the Heat Problem, but the audio is really bad. And um, actually, so is the video. So I'm not going to subject you to that unless I feel that it's necessary. But my point then was, it's a bit strange, isn't it? To have so many videos that are like the final annihilation of the heat problem, end game for the heat problem. And then like, they're never the actual last video on the subject because each time that a solution is proposed, it's shown to be wholly inadequate by multiple orders of magnitude. Because remember, right, like the big organizations, Answers in Genesis, CMI, ICR, all of them recognize that this problem is currently unsolved and is probably unsolvable to the extent that they're going to have to appeal to a miracle or like future physics or something like that. But like Donnie just will not do that, evidently. Except, wait a second, he already has left that door open. Although we may not know the source or the mechanism behind the supercooling, perhaps it is uh, supernatural. The Bible does say that God is, is Lord over the flood. Oh yeah, and remember that time in the same video when he said that if he received a sufficient debunk to his latest idea, which was like the fission tracks and helium and zircons thing, which I spent quite a bit of time on, that he would own that there's actually a heat problem? If I get a sufficient response to that, I'll admit that currently there, there's no solution to the heat problem. Now, I didn't ever think I was going to actually get that admission from Donnie that there's no solution to the heat problem. I think that he just thought his helium and zircons and fission tracks argument was like so good that he was like, haha, I won't see any consequences for these actions. But I think there's something extra pathetic about continuing on with these like goofy hyperbolic titles about like how crushed the heat problem actually is when the situation is so dire. And like, I'm not sure if these are being put forward because they think like the audience turnover is fast enough that whoever's currently hearing it will not know that this has been debunked or if they just don't care. But like, guys, 
In fact, here's a list of all of those potential solutions that I'm still hearing being brought up by you guys that I have already debunked using other people and other sources, right? And so what I want to do is I want to go over the two latest attempts by Donnie to annihilate the heat problem. This is fun and easy content to me, and I just kind of wanted to make this to remind Donnie, as well as those audience members of his that, like, sometimes watch my content, that, like, no, you, you haven't solved the heat problem, you know you didn't solve it, but, like, you're still saying that you, you did or you might have, and, like, you're also reusing old ideas that still don't work. Basically, I made this video uh, to make fun of you and embarrass you a little bit. There's some people out there who don't like when I get mean like this. They don't like when I, like, make fun of people. They think that it's kind of hateful and mean-spirited. It is. Yeah, it completely is. Just a reminder that it costs zero dollars to be nice. How much, uh, well, what is it to be an asshole? I can Venmo you. That's not the point. It's free, isn't it? But that's because I don't think that this channel is good faith. I don't think that it is run by good faith actors. I think Donnie knows that he's wrong, like, on a lot of different stuff. I just think that he doesn't care. I think that he likes to make the videos. I think that they make him feel good. I think he likes the attention, and I'm happy to give it to him, to be perfectly honest. I didn't used to be. I used to be on my high horse about that, like, oh, I won't. I won't go over that. No, I will, because I make money off of it, and I like exposing people to bad science and I like walking them through the ways by which we can find out that it's bad and kind of dissect it, do a little autopsy. So without further ado, um, let's go over these two videos titled Crushing the Heat Problem and the other one is called Solving the Genesis Flood Heat Problem. Now I want you guys to tell me honestly, do you think that they do it? So first we start off with Sam's video, Sam of Redefined Living. Before we go any further, I'm gonna put on some music to set the mood. Now where were we? He has zero relevant education and is basically just Donnie's friend who co-mods sometimes and acts like a jackass. Sam is the resident presuppositionalist, so really all he exists to do is to interrupt and, like, ask you where logic comes from, or, like, how do you know that you can trust your senses? The usual rigmarole from a guy like that. Right off the bat, the first thing that he does is basically say that everything from a Christian worldview, and of course when he says that we all know he means uh, the worldview that he in particular holds of scripture, so his particular scriptural interpretation, since the majority of Christians like aren't young earth creationists and don't believe what Sam believes. But he begins with saying like, because creation is a supernatural event, necessarily everything in nature and indeed everything in reality is effectively supernatural anyways. So like, why not appeal to miracles? There's actually nothing on the biblical worldview, nothing that is purely physical and not supernatural. Oh, okay, Sam. So if everything is supernatural, then allow me to ask you a question. How do you actually differentiate miracles from like regular supernatural stuff? Can miracles exist at all if everything is inherently supernatural? I would say no, and that Sam is kind of just throwing this out there as like a stray thought, like a shower thought that he had and decided to, to utilize. But I would actually contend that Sam believes that miracles are starkly different from business as usual or the world as governed by natural laws that he feels are are set in place by God, except the mean ones about the age of the earth and evolutionary theory. I would wager that Sam's understanding of identifying a miracle would be if it violates those natural laws. Functionally, this means he agrees that there is like a natural and a supernatural. In understanding this, you guys, I would argue that this is a moral issue because um, we don't want to misrepresent our position as Christians. We don't want to misrepresent God by agreeing to that false premise that everything has a standalone naturalistic interpretation. So, um, and so for the Christians out there that, you know, I'm not saying that we shouldn't desire to explain everything scientifically within the physical realm. Um, but I'm just saying that we, that, that is not, that it's not an option that is that for us, it's the only way to do it. Okay. You guys see what I mean here, right? Like Sam wants to leave the door open for miracles, but like what he just said kind of violates the first portion. Either everything is supernatural and you can't identify miracles, or miracles exist and can be parsed out as supernatural events from the otherwise natural world. 
But also, as usual, I'm going to speak for myself here. The second that these guys actually do invoke miracles as a solution for the heat problem, I don't care anymore. Like, the game is over. Samuel is really interested in this potential for allowing miracles for the solution to the heat problem, saying this. Um, my question then would be, why can't God do miracles? And like, yeah, Sam, like, you can do miracles if you want. Like, you can say it's miracles, but it's not science. It's not within the purview of science. And at that point, to me, like, this is just you having your personal perspective, your personal religious beliefs. And like, I just don't want to engage with them. I don't think they're interesting. Uh, I think it's a lot of special pleading. And um, well, to be honest, at that point, it's no different to me than arguing with the Scientologist who's supposing like that Xenu did all of this crazy stuff to get Earth where it is today. I think there's a chasm separating regular science affirming Christianity from young Earth creationism, which has to do all sorts of mental gymnastics to explain the data from the natural world. And that's why I'm comparing YEC specifically to Scientology, whereas I don't think mainstream Christianity falls into that same problematic pit. Even if you can show that there is some problem here with the heat, we're never going to we're never going to dismiss our god. <laughs> Why is he doing a show on this if he doesn't know what the scientific reasoning behind the heat problem actually is? Like, yes, there is an enormous multifaceted heat problem Standing for Truth and all of the other young earth creationists have like dealt with exactly zero of the major sources of the heat. So yes, there is in fact a problem. Conventional science is like, hey, by the way, based off of a rudimentary understanding of physics, doing the global flood from evangelical young earth creationism is going to result in so much heat, regardless of the flood model that you're using, that you're going to vaporize the granite crust of the earth several dozen times over. And Sam is like, mm, well, I don't know about that. That's not proof. It's still debatable, but it's a good piece of evidence. And then he's like, that's not going to cause us to dismiss our God. Sam, you absolute joker. No one is saying that. Absolutely no one is saying that. There is not a soul out there who is saying that the heat problem means you can't be a Christian. It just means you can't be a young earth creationist. Science affirming Christians just laugh and laugh and laugh when they see this slop. Like we identify with Christ regardless. And that should be the attitude of the Christian. We should not be swayed by any, any of these pseudo arguments that are presented. I bet God's really embarrassed when Sam says stuff like this. He's like, holy moly, every aspect of my own creation screams that the earth is incredibly ancient and that evolution is responsible for all of modern biodiversity. How many different ways can I tell you these two brute facts? And Sam is just like, la 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 la, I don't hear it. Yeah, well, if you had a closer relationship with God, you would know that. It's actually, like, pretty embarrassing. I wouldn't really admit that to a lot of people if I were you. Sam goes on to list a bunch of examples in the Bible of situations that have fire or heat that are abnormal or miraculous, like the burning bush or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being in the fiery furnace. And he basically does this to say... God is used to dealing with heat problems, and uh, so what's one more? Yeah, because the Bible does not explicitly say that there was in fact a heat, a heat problem, and so we don't know if there was or not from a biblical perspective. So, And it's like, okay, well, there's two problems with that. Um, one, a burning bush is a little bit different from the equivalent of vaporizing the earth about two dozen times over, or the equivalent of like over 40 hydrogen bombs being detonated in every cubic kilometer of the earth. I would say those are slightly different levels of miracle. Uh, and the second thing is, isn't it a little bit weird that God just outright said that the other ones were miracles and just is completely silent on the heat problem with regard to Noah's Ark? Probably because that story is not meant to be taken literally. We can say, and I hope that I've shown, that if there was a heat problem, at least if if we are accepting our worldview on our terms, then there was in fact no heat problem at all. And I mean that um, we can just grant that there was a bunch of heat for the sake of this discussion, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we do. 
Right, so there's the preceptor side of him rearing its ugly head. He's like, we're here and we believe that the Bible is true and specifically that our interpretation of the Bible is true and relatively immutable. And so because of that, clearly there was no heat problem. Um, no, actually. If you are here to tell the tale, that doesn't mean the heat occurred and then was miraculously or otherwise dealt with. It means the global flood, which would have produced said heat, did not happen. So Sam's position is, if science says there's a heat problem, they don't actually have a heat problem because pre-sup. But then he's like, I don't even know that science says that there's necessarily a heat problem. And he goes into his sort of like science arguments. Well, let's take a look at some of the assumptions. So from a scientific perspective, this alleged problem assumes starting positions that cannot be proven. And if they cannot prove the starting positions, their presuppositions that they are arguing from, then the best that they can say is that based on their extrapolations of the past or whatever it might be, that there may have been a problem. So does anybody know the starting conditions? That's the question. This is the most nervous sounding regurgitation of Woodmerap or Baumgardner's argument that I've ever heard. So the two of them have consistently proposed that there are assumptions used in radiometric dating, and so therefore, how can we actually trust radiometric dates? And the reason this is important is because Tim is basically saying, what if everything was created till gold? Or what if decay worked differently? Or what if when the rocks formed, they were actually already partially decayed? No, Sam. I've been over this many, many times on the channel, so we're doing another Donnie Deals fallacy where you guys just reassert the same point. But we watch rocks form today. We see them form. And when they form, conventionally speaking, they begin with all parent and zero daughter. I've also talked about exceptions to that rule and how we clock those exceptions in the rock record. It, it was the environment. What was the environment like or the previous temperature of the Earth's core? Does anybody know? I know why he's bringing this up, but I just want to remark here that the temperature of the core of the Earth at any given time does not impact the radioactive decay law. Again, remember, we, we are not accepting their naturalistic presuppositions, which if we were to do a different stream on, um, on presenting them uh, with arguments from their own camp against those, they're not going to be able to defend any of these um, consistencies in nature, especially not over time, the uniformity in nature, and all of those things that they borrow from our worldview. Gibberish. They're going to have some problems there. So does anybody know the pre-flood water content of the crust? It doesn't matter. Your problem is accelerated nuclear decay and all the radiation and heat that comes from that. Water in the Earth's crust will not help you, and you have seen the math for why this is the case. But then you've also got problems from limestone and magma hardening and the impact events, et cetera, et cetera. And this is pretty interesting because there are new findings. We're continually finding that there was in fact, and possibly is in fact, more water currently under the crust than there is above the earth. Well, first of all, citation needed, right? I'm pretty sure he's talking about ringwoodite, but I'd like to know what he's specifically talking about with regard to these recent studies. But second of all, it doesn't matter, Sam. You know where your problem comes from. Surely you've at least been paying that much attention. Uh, but understanding the, the global flood, the fountains of the great deep bursting forth, it is, is it possible that, that there was a water bed underneath the earth and there would have been no friction at all? In the same way that you, you know, release a balloon, you blow up a, a balloon and you release it and it floats around in the air and the, you know, in your room and then until it finally hits the ground in that same way, could it be possible that, you know, almost like when you, when you have a cup or a bucket with a leaf on top and you try to dump the water out, the leaf kind of just floats around and as the water spills out, that could be, um, but again, we simply don't know. I mean, what was that? What was that? What were, what were you trying to say? How would you say your mental focus is? Oh, it's focused. <laughs> I, say it's, I think it's, I, I haven't, look, I have trouble even mentioning, even saying to myself my own head the number of years. I no more think of myself as being as old as I am than fly. So how did they rule out uh, hydroplaning, which is kind of what we just talked about, hydroplaning of the continents? while the fountains of the deep broke forth. I mean, is that not an option? Do they know? One, I covered this in my video on Walt Brown's hydroplate theory, and no, it doesn't work. Two, it doesn't matter because your biggest problem is the accelerated nuclear decay. Again, they're gonna need to explain to me how they know 
the starting conditions and how that wasn't an option. And remember, you guys, they need to not straw man us. Sam, you can watch any of my videos on the topic if you want it explained to you how we know the starting conditions. Or you could just rewind it in this video if you feel like it. Okay. What about phenomenon such as uh, liquefraction on a grander scale? Um, is that a possibility? Um, I don't know. Do we know that? Maybe. Maybe not. This is like the BoJack Horseman game show name. What do celebrities know? Do they know things? Let's find out. Uh, but we do know this actually, Sam. So first, it's liquefaction, not liquefraction. Um, second, it still produces friction, although the friction is lower. Third, the conditions you would need to induce liquefaction on the entire globe are not possible, and if they were, they would create more problems for you, even heat-wise, than they would solve. Which leads me to fourth, it has been considered, no, it doesn't work, and finally, fifth, it still doesn't matter because that's not your primary source of heat. But this is granting that there, that there, um, there may or may not be a problem. We don't know. We're just we're arguing their presuppositions to find out if they are even um, if if they even have the right to even pose us with this problem. Maybe they do. I don't know. Sam gives a couple more examples of like things that have nothing to do with the heat problem, or at least the major sources of heat within the heat problem. And then he says this. And so um, I, I'm not sure how they calculate this heat problem. So I've gone over this in basically every single video that I've made on the topic, where the heat comes from and why we calculate it the way we've calculated it. But like, okay, maybe Sam doesn't watch non-Young Earth creationist content. But the question I then have is, if you are giving a talk on the heat problem, why haven't you read any of the actual literature from the Young Earth Creationist camp on this? Because they provide all of their math in overly gratuitous fashion, believe it or not, in their Thermal Problems with the Genesis Flood series. Sam, you didn't even do your homework for your own presentation within your own camp. You know, I want to know how they come to these conclusions. What are their assumptions? You have no excuse for this. All of this is available and open to you. You could have looked any of this up and come better prepared. I want to know. If you're going to present me with an argument, you should at least know what you're talking about. Yeah, I agree with that sentiment. You should at least know what you're talking about if you're going to present an argument. Um, there are simply too many unknowns. And there is, we are, we also don't know what we don't know. If you want to appeal to new physics, Sam, which is what you're going to have to do to get around the source of the majority of the heat from the heat problem from accelerated nuclear decay, which you need to break physics to even get, let alone deal with the heat from, uh, then you, you can appeal to new physics, but then at present, you still have an unsolved heat problem. From their perspective, anytime they're going to try to present an argument as though it is a fact, they really have no grounds to do that because all conclusions in science are provisional, right? You can find, we could have found something last week that overturns everything that they believe. And we often argue here that that is the case. This isn't going to be the kind of problem that's solved by like a, a random geology paper, Sam, right? Like KC, a biomedical physicist in his discussion with David McQueen on this very subject pointed out that you have to radically change physics. You're talking about a discovery that would rewrite physics as we know it. Right, this would be like the discovery to end all discoveries that physics as we know it is just fundamentally broken. And then that new physics would also have to explain all of the data that the previous physics, the one we currently accept, easily explained. In the end though, it doesn't matter because even you sitting here appealing to new physics means that your current heat problem still exists and it exists without even anything close to a solution. So when we understand this, we realize that the intellectually dishonest critics are never satisfied. And you guys all know this just by looking in the comment section. They're not looking for, um, you know, consistent lines of reasoning. They're not looking for that evidence that they're always asking for. No, you're right, Sam. We're not looking for evidence that would support the notion of accelerated nuclear decay because it is currently precluded by physics, right? This would be like trying to find support for miasma theory, which is currently precluded by germ theory. Sam goes on to say that people go looking for evidence for things that they may or may not believe in all the time. And then he points to like people who believe in ghosts. And then he says this incredible line. 
But there is a book that I haven't read yet, and it, it's about near-death experiences. Wonderful. This is how I imagine he treats any and all reading assignments. Then he takes a moment to go full presuppositionalist on us. It's a heart problem, you guys. The more militant these atheists are, we know they're just running. They're absconding from the God they know. They say they don't believe in God, but actually they spend all their time obsessing on God. They hate God. And um, we need to pray for these people because they, you know, they need that redemption. Yet again, I'm left wondering where agnostics, religious people who accept the ancient age of the earth and the theory of evolution, and specifically Christians who do so, fit in this equation. Uh, but then he hits us with um, the, the real punchline of this particular talk because I've intentionally been leaving out the title of this particular presentation, which is the theological heat problem. So see if you can guess what the theological heat problem is before he says it. So God desires to rescue all of us from the coming heat problem. And that problem is the fire that burns eternally. You really are the most devious bastard in New York City. That's right. The real heat problem is actually going to hell. Amen. Slam dunk, brother. <laughs> you brought the heat. Damn, bro, you got the whole squad laughing. I predicted you'd bring the heat before I actually got to witness this presentation firsthand. And that's the gold standard of science, brother, because prediction confirmed. You brought the heat tonight against the heat problem. This is why you should never believe Donnie when he gives you a compliment. There's no way that Donnie thought that went well, in my personal opinion, but... And I love how you ended your presentation. Critics that want to deny the gospel, they want to deny the authority of God's word because of the heat problem. They're going to have their own heat problem. Isn't that right, brother? In eternity. Thank you for that wonderful insight, Donnie. That was extremely helpful. That added a lot, I think, to the end of the presentation. As usual, though, like science affirming religious people just do not exist. It, it always must be a dichotomy with these people. And it's it, it should be terrifying for all of us. It's it's terrifying for me to know that, you know, there are people that are going to go there. This sounds like something you should talk to a therapist about. I'm not licensed to deal with it. Well, you're going to get what you want, but I don't think you know right. what you want. I don't think Sam knows what an empty threat that is when he's talking to people that don't have the same perspective on religion as he does. Like, does he think that's scary to people that don't believe hell exists? Does it bother him that he's going to hell in a lot of other religious perspectives? Anyways, this was a super epic swing and miss from Sam. I don't know that I expected anything differently. This is Redefined Living we're talking about here. He doesn't really have the background in anything relevant to offer anything new to the heat problem conversation. So the best he could do is, but what about you're going to hell. This could have gone better. This is suboptimal. This is a rough start right here. If it was a speed run, this would be a reset. This is uh, about as bad as you could expect. I think it was an embarrassing showing. On its own, it wasn't worth covering or even making a joke about. And the only reason I'm covering it now is because the much better, funnier presentation is next. Now, I actually found out about this presentation from Standing for Truth, who showed up in my live chat during my triple release covering, like, the Robert Carter, Jeffrey Tompkins stuff recently. And he shows up and says this. We solved the heat problem and we'll be having an open mic debate on the numbers for January 11th at 7 p.m. EST. Be there, critics. Heat problem. Yes. Solved. No, I immediately responded to him and I was like, if this is about those two recent ICC papers, then it's not really a solution to the heat problem. It's addressing a very particular aspect of heat produced and it has to do a lot with like seafloor spreading and things of that nature. Nothing to do with accelerated nuclear decay. But I told him I would come anyways to the presentation and uh, see what I thought since he says the heat problem is solved and then titled the presentation, the Genesis flood heat problem solved. All right. Welcome, everybody, to Standing for Truth. My name is Donnie, and this is Sam, and we are your hosts and moderators for tonight's much-anticipated event. Yeah, so tonight is the night you guys have all been waiting for, where we will be focusing our time here on solving this alleged Genesis flood heat problem. So I was in chat eagerly awaiting this presentation to see how it addresses the heat problem right? Like the, the whole thing, the, the thing that I was told was going to be addressed. 
The title of David's initial presentation is A Solution to the Genesis Flood Heat Problem Using Proof by Contradiction. Cool. So a solution to the Genesis Flood Heat Problem. That that second part is a little worrisome, but I was like, that first part? Okay, check. So David will be setting the foundation for an open mic discussion uh, get, by giving a comprehens comprehensive presentation on the solution to the apparent heat problems. Okay, got it. The, the solution to the heat problem, right? The, the, the whole thing, right? David, the floor is yours, brother. Oh, okay, so the title of the first part of the presentation I'm doing tonight is uh, the solution to the heat problem for the Genesis Flood. Uh, as a result of CPT, that's catastrophic plate tectonics using proof by contradiction. Immediately after he says this, Andrew Coming in the chat says, as a result of CPT, this doesn't look all encompassing so far. I, I would assume everybody's watching this knows this, but um, the heat problem as it's been described um, is that most models of catastrophic plate tectonics require that large amounts of hot crustal material would be spread across the ocean floor during the flood especially the Atlantic Ocean. This would release so much heat as to possibly boil the oceans. Because of this problem, the Genesis flood didn't happen. Thus, the Bible is wrong and evolution is right. Um, wow. No. Um, first of all, again, that tail end is quite telling, right? Thus, <laughs> the Bible is wrong and evolution is right. Hmm. What an interesting way of framing things. I wonder what perspective David is coming from. But also, the heat problem is typically utilized to, like, refer to all of the heat problems, right? Like, collectively, depending, like, usually it's couched, like, within whatever model it is we're talking about, but it's still all of the heat problems within it. That's, like, the, the heat problem with the flood. But even if you want to take away things like accelerated nuclear decay and impact events, things of that nature, CPT, or catastrophic plate tectonics, has a primary heat problem to it, and it's actually the friction of the continental plates atop the mantle, not seafloor spreading. When you analyze all the different ways that you can um, deal with all this heat that supposedly was deposited during the flood, we've got only five different ways we can deal with this. Now, remember, he's only dealing with the heat associated with his particular subject, right? He's not touching things like friction or impact events or limestone or accelerated nuclear decay. At least not yet. He's just talking about his thing. And um, I like that he includes in number five that potential solutions are like new physics or a miracle because like, yeah, th those are the only options really that you have left. Hilariously, one of the first things that David does is talk about the different thermal reservoirs that could potentially take up some of this heat, things like the ocean or the crust or the mantle. And he says this. If we're talking about um, a you're going to say dump all this heat into the land or dump some heat into the land, depending upon how deep that heat's going, it was how you would calculate the heat capacity. Um, there's a problem with all these reservoirs. I'm going to start with the mantle. There's really no way to transfer any of this heat to the mantle. That just doesn't work. Um, I was immediately in the chat like, Oof, poor David McQueen. There really is no way to transfer the heat to the mantle. Because if you will recall, that was David McQueen's solution. He was appealing to these mysterious blobs that were going to suck the heat from the crust into the mantle and thus get rid of it once and for all. Tube. So this is a nice clip to have in our back pocket because I'm sure Donnie will eventually retreat back to David McQueen after he's shown that the solutions that him and Rob Matt have proposed, and we'll get to those in a little bit, also like aggressively do not work. But then David proceeds to spend like quite a bit of his presentation talking about why all of these alternative methods for getting rid of the heat just from his one source, his seafloor spreading and adjacent um, heat sources problem, why nothing really works other than the one that he's proposing, the solution that he's proposing. Transferring the heat to a thermal reservoir um, it really doesn't work for any of these. So if we go back to the previous slide temporarily, if we can't transfer the heat to another thermal reservoir, if that's not going to work, and if number one isn't going to work either, because there's no feasible chemical reaction, phase change, or mechanical process that can absorb all this heat, and I don't uh, accept number five. Here's your spoiler. He doesn't accept number five because he's a pre-supper. Then that leaves only two options to get rid of this heat 
is it either needs to be radiated to outer space or it needs to stay in the suboceanic crust. Those are the only two options left. Now, a bunch of us in the chat were like, okay, but is he going to talk about accelerated nuclear decay? And Donnie confirms that, yes, he will absolutely be talking about accelerated nuclear decay. So David then proceeds to take most of his first presentation and talk about what he feels the best solution is for, like, his heat problem, like the one that he's specifically discussing with the seafloor spreading and seafloor spreading uh, adjacent stuff. And he comes to the conclusion that it is hydrothermal convection and like, cool. I'm happy to just take him at his word for that because as you'll see later, the amount of heat that he's even dealing with is less than 1%. So it's like, I don't really feel like taking the time and doing a deep dive into something that is ultimately so inconsequential to the entire problem. Of course, Brian from Apologetics 101 was like, you need to give him a chance to give his entire presentation before you like write him off. And it's like, again, like he's dealing with so little of the actual heat problem. I was like, yeah, I'm happy to come on to this open mic if he talks about accelerated nuclear decay and offers up a solution. He saves accelerated nuclear decay and impact events. I don't know why those two in particular, I mean, I know why accelerated nuclear decay, but like why impact events? Why not limestone or magma hardening or friction, whatever? Why impact events? I, I figure it's because Donnie like told him that he needed to cover it. But anyways, so he brings up accelerated nuclear decay and he's like, yeah, there's still an issue. And then he proceeds to explain why there's still an issue. So um, nuclear accelerated nuclear decay still has a heat heat issue here. Then he talks about impact events. Um, okay, another issue, a heat related issue that was mentioned was asteroid impacts. Um, those are kind of tricky. And on that, he says, I kid you not, his explanation for why impact events aren't problematic is you can get a range for the amount of heat that's actually released upon impact based off of a crater, like working backwards. And so there's too much uncertainty. And so it'd be easy for someone to just point to that uncertainty and, and use that as kind of a get out of jail free. And so somebody who who believes that there were all these asteroid impacts in the flood, I don't believe that, but somebody who does believe that could easily say that there's a lot less energy than you think there is just because of the uncertainties in the energy of the... Um, asteroid impact. In the chat, I was like, wait, what? Uh? We're going to come back to the accelerated nuclear decay stuff because first, a different young earth creationist, this guy named Andrew McCord, who I guess supports uh, workers CPT model, like workers specific numbers with regard to the CPT model, which are higher than what David here was reporting in the ICC. He comes in and basically says, why are your numbers so low? And David is kind of like, well, I don't think Worker did a good enough job proving that the heat would have been that high. And if he has that high of heat, it's going to be hard to account for. Uh, therefore, that heat was probably not there. That's not a problem for God to solve. It's a problem for you because your model can't explain what you find in the field or can't explain the experimental evidence. Now, as far as Worker is concerned, um, I think his problem is he was trying to get rid of all the heat within a year. And that doesn't work. So Andrew McCord kind of doubles down. He messages again. And I was communicating with him as well because I was like, I, I don't know this YEC, you know, so I was curious as to his perspective. And um, to this, David actually says that he feels that Worker is using like unwarranted uniformitarian assumptions. And I, I think that it's like not unwarranted, right? Because David hasn't presented a reason as to why we shouldn't use the same like methodology for determining temperature at given depths today, like in the past. Um, he's using unif I hate to say it, but he's using uniformitarian assumptions that says 50, 60 kilometer depth. Um, and he's trying to remove heat from 50 to from 50 to 60 kilometers of depth. So um, I, I don't see that you can remove that much uh, heat in uh, uh, is from climate. But ultimately, David's answer stays the same, right? He's like, it can't have been that hot because we can't get rid of that kind of heat. And I'll explain more and how much we can remove from climate. But uh, my response to that is if that heat was, I don't want to say generated, if, if, the, if those rock layers, those geologic layers were that hot at the end of the flood, they're still that hot. Mm. The temperature hasn't gone anywhere. And I appreciate his honesty. I want to be very clear here, right? Like 
this stream is not embarrassing for David. David put a lot of work into the test that he ran within the parameters that he utilized. Obviously, it does not help the heat problem for any flood model, ultimately, but um, still, he put in a lot of work and we can appreciate that. This is embarrassing for Donnie. Speaking of which, let's get to that part. So you did touch on this one at the end of your first presentation. So if you wanted to reiterate anything, as it is a major sticking point to the critics, so Gutsit Gibbon is pointing out that the vast majority of the heat comes from accelerated nuclear decay, though. There's the amount there. And any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it was 10 to the 30 joules. Uh, I think it's like two or maybe it was seven. I don't remember. Something times 10 to the 30 joules. For the record, it depends on whether you're trying to deal with 500 million years worth of accelerated nuclear decay or 4.5 billion years worth of accelerated nuclear decay. A lot of creationists that believe in that, and I don't believe in accelerated nuclear decay, but a lot of them that believe in that will try to throw that into the, um, into the whole Noah's flood thing right. because they think it happened at the same time. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's, I've demonstrated exactly the problem you have with accelerated nuclear decay is that the temperature will keep rising until you get that steady state where you're releasing as much heat to outer space as you are generating and so um accelerate the only the only way to make accelerated nuclear decay work is you'd have to have some miraculous heat removal and then now you've got to explain why god caused accelerated nuclear decay to happen and then had to miraculously remove the heat it's like doesn't really make sense. I mean, why would God do that? I don't I don't really see any reason why he would cause accelerated nuclear decay to happen. I mean, I realize that there's an issue with radiometric dating and it doesn't agree with the Bible and I get that. I don't know what the solution for that is, but it's not accelerated nuclear decay. That's my opinion. Anyways. The only way to make accelerated nuclear decay work is you'd have to have some miraculous heat removal and then now you've got to explain why God caused accelerated nuclear decay to happen and then had to miraculously remove the heat. And it's like, it doesn't really make sense. I mean, why would God do that? I don't, I don't really see any reason why he would cause accelerated nuclear decay to happen. Wow, amazing. I was losing my mind in real time on this one. What a delight. What a, what a lovely thing to catch live. But it actually just kept getting better. Let me ask you a, a, a somewhat related question. Are you familiar with the Proton, I think it's Proton 21 Laboratories and their Z-Pinch experiments? I've heard of that, but I mean, uh, well, okay, what context are you referring to? Because I've heard, I've heard Z-Pinch being thrown around and... Um... Sam completely botches what the Z-Pinch actually is to the surprise of absolutely no one. Yeah, because I, I believe that this, what they're calling the the rate, the accelerated nuclear decay is that that's just a product of, of when these elements are created. They're created with these certain signatures that, that they're calling decay, if I understand it properly. Um, I'm not going to go into it if you're not familiar with it. I know that uh, Donnie just did a presentation. What was that yesterday? And, and Raw Matt, uh, he, he went into um, some depth on this. I think it would be something that you might be interested in. But I've it's, heard uh, of it, and I'm not impressed. Not okay. impressed. <sighs> that sucks. That's, uh, I mean. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> wow, that's it. You can just see the pain on Sam's face with that one. But fortunately, uh, Donnie stutters into the rescue. So, and just to clarify, because I understand what you were saying earlier, because you were saying that accelerated decay is not necessarily associated with CPT, because you were pointing out that some who hold the CPT would also hold to accelerated decay and make it part of it. Rather, you arguing CPT, but you don't hold to accelerated decay. So you can All hold right. the CPT, but not accelerated decay. Yeah, and as far as accelerated nuclear decay, it's got other problems than just heat. Okay, well, I think that's good in terms of clarifying questions for now. David, it's not even my birthday anymore. How could you go so over the top with all these gifts? Very quickly, um, <laughs> another question slams into the stream. Based theory, Grayson, he is asking if you have given an actual number for the amount of heat that needs to be uh, dealt with yet. So have some fun with that. Oh, oh, okay, well, I mean, that... 
That's going to be model specific. He goes on for a while about the various variables that are at play in different types of flood models. Uh, and then he says this. You know, I, I apologize that I can't give you an exact amount, a number for the amount of heat that needs to be dealt with. But there's so many moving parts in this. On this one, I think a simple I don't know would have sufficed, to be perfectly honest. How would you respond to a critic who would say the heat and radiation generated from accelerated decay precludes the Genesis flood from being true? <laughs> Donnie is just directly quoting me here. That is the exact language that I use to describe the heat problem. So thank you, Donnie. I would say that like the heat and radiation preclude the global flood. I would say if the accelerated nuclear decay didn't happen, that argument's worthless. Right. <laughs> now, for sake of argument, for the sake of the argument, if you were to put yourself in the shoes of a creationist who does hold the accelerated decay, for the sake of argument, would they have an unsolvable heat problem where they would have to look to a supernatural explanation? Or do you think there's a way around that scientifically? They would have to figure out a way to cause accelerated nuclear decay that doesn't cause heat. Hypothetically, I just I couldn't have asked for a better answer myself. And so here's an interesting point. And I agree with Paul here. I agree with what you're saying, David. He says, I don't think we need to hang our hats on accelerated decay. I think we've demonstrated that for sure. He says it's a theory, but it's not the only explanation out there. To explain the nuclear dates that we find, like in every rock across the planet and also all meteorites, yes, it is your only option. And it's not even a theory. It's just a hypothesis and a bum one at that. What would be an alternative explanation then for a critic who says, well, you're going to have to account for, for the decay. You're going to have to account for what we see in terms of radioactive elements in the Earth, David. My answer is I don't know. I do not know the answer to that question. The Bible gives one timeline. Uh, center radiometric dating gives another timeline. I don't know what the, what the discrepancy is. I will give the pain a 10. My answer is I don't know. I do not know the answer to that question. The Bible gives one timeline. Uh, center radiometric dating is another timeline. I don't know what the what the discrepancy is. Poor Donnie, <laughs> that's no good. That sucks. Oh my gosh, <sighs> what must that be like having your guests turn on you like that? Then Donnie suggests an alternative hypothesis that I've already been over. Why it doesn't work? What if there was accelerated decay during the creation week? since it was an accelerated uh, accelerated processes were taking place during that week anyways. Any thoughts on that, David? Well, I mean, you can always use the miracles to get rid of the accelerated, I mean, to get rid of this heat, but you just have to justify why God would do such a thing. Hmm. Otherwise, you're asking for an unnecessary miracle. I mean, thank you, David. I, I could have handled this one on my own. What I was going to say was you can appeal to the creation week for a miraculous removal of like the first 4 billion years, right? But the flood is responsible for 500 million years worth, at least of the geologic column, including the dates within them. So you're at least responsible for 500 million years worth of decay, which is at least 10 raised 29 joules probably a little bit more. So no, Donnie, that, that's not going to fix your problem, even if you do insert a miracle at the beginning. So next, Donnie doubles back to talk a little bit about why David thinks that accelerated nuclear decay didn't happen. And he proposes this hypothetical creationist that would point to like fission tracks and radio halos as a way of knowing that accelerated nuclear decay happened. He's like, what if there's this guy who says that this is why we know accelerated nuclear decay definitely happened? Accelerated decay has happened. Okay, <laughs> That's the most important point. Um, and from a conventional standpoint, how we know that billions of years of decay has in fact happened and thus that the earth is billions of years old. So I know a lot of creationists would have questions relating to, so for example, those that hold to catastrophic plate tectonics, but also accelerated nuclear decay, they would look at these microscopic areas of damage in the rocks, uh, radio halos to be specific, to argue for accelerated decay process, processes at, at the flood. So I was, I was wondering how, how you would deal with radio halos, David, if you had any thoughts on that. Um, I don't know. Um, and this is what David says. I, I've read a lot of stuff regarding uh, radiometric dating issues that creationists have put forth. I haven't seen anything that's satisfactory, is my opinion. I know the Babel timeline is correct, because, I mean, it's, it's correct. 
but at the same time, you know, there this evidence for uh, radium after dating seems to be correct, and obviously the two can't both be correct, and so I really don't know what the answer is. I mean, I'm obviously going to accept what the Bible has to say, but I don't know how to resolve the issue as far as that's concerned. I don't know if I've ever said this to you guys on this channel, but I've mused about this to other people in my life. Sometimes I wonder if God dislikes Donnie. <laughs> If Donnie did something to really piss God off and, you know, he just kind of takes it out on Donnie every now and again. Or maybe God just really likes me. Maybe I've done something to win favor. Next, David starts answering questions from the chat again and they invite people in to this open mic. And I considered going in for a while, but I was like, what is there to even say? Honestly. Um, but David once again reveals that he's like the most honest person in the room, first of all. But then, fascinatingly enough, he just like openly appeals to a miracle for what triggers the flood to start in the first place. So David is of the opinion that it's like, yeah, like the, fl the flood's already miraculous. So, you know, it's interesting that he's so reticent to invoke a miracle himself or something like accelerated nuclear decay, but. Hmm? God did something to cause it to move. I mean, he's not gonna let the flood start when, until he's ready. So there was something, there was some law of physics or something that was broken in order to get everything started and, you know, um, at least to initiate the catastrophic plate tectonics. I ask a question next and I'm like, hey, um, I noticed that your explanation for like why impact events aren't problematic was really incomplete. Like you're basically just like, nah, -uh. and uh, to that, <laughs> David says this. As far as the next one, uh, my impact s solution, um, she's correct that I haven't uh, shown any math behind it. Um, I don't, I'm of the opinion that um, as far as impacts are concerned, that it is very hard to estimate how much energy is per asteroid impact. T-Rock shows up and kind of just sits down there like a lithified piece of limestone, which is funny because you'll remember him from the limestone conversation. Uh, and then Mr. Anderson shows up. Now, Mr. Anderson is not a young Earth creationist. Um, in fact, he would be much more allied with the group of like folks who accept conventional science. It, when I say much more, I mean he is. And interestingly enough, Mr. Anderson is actually a lawyer. So the conversation that ensues is extremely interesting and I want to go over just a little bit of it because I found it so funny. You were saying that the, the accelerated uh, nuclear decay doesn't work as in you don't think that it happened? No, accelerated nuclear decay has a heat problem. It, that's a valid I know. Uh, well, I, I mean, I think we're that's all aware saying. of that. I also really like Mr. Anderson because he kind of gives it right back to Sam when Sam acts like a jackass. Uh, real quick, um, uh, he might not you know be what? aware uh, of that. Sam, I think, I think I only have a limited amount of time here, so uh, if you, you wouldn't might, mind, if we oh, need you, I will Mr. certainly, Mr. will certainly let you know. Yeah, Mr. Anderson, one second. You might, you might have missed that there are different models, and not all models uh, accept the accelerated nuclear decay. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Uh, okay, so David, um... <laughs> that, that little bit at the end makes me laugh every time. I I've been editing this video, and every time I see it, I, I laugh at it because it's just like, if you've ever been in a conversation with Sam, like when he does the come in and rescue the guest when he feels like it's making young Earth creationism look bad. And that happens a lot. It's happened to me. It's happened to many other people. And those of you in the comments that have interacted with Sam, you can confirm or deny this uh, if you'd like. But it's just really satisfying to see Mr. Anderson be like, yeah, okay, Sam, thank you. Thanks so much. We'll, we'll let you know if we need you. <laughs> I also don't know of a flood model that doesn't have accelerated nuclear decay as a part of it in this day and age, because otherwise you're going to have to say, okay, God made four billion years worth of time just look old and then 500 million years worth during like the portions of the geologic column they suppose happened during the flood year. Like, what do you do with that? How do you explain the dates within that portion of the geologic column? Like, I don't think there's an explanation for that outside of accelerated nuclear decay, which obviously also doesn't work. Now, Mr. Anderson is really interested in the maximum amount of heat that the model that David subscribes to could actually get rid of. And David is really non-committal about it. Okay. But but the the point is that 10 to the 27 over that uh period of time that you're talking about is the maximum that that your model can handle, right? Give or take, yeah. I mean climate okay. modeling will give us a more exact number. Correct. Okay. And and according to AIG, the estimate of the amount of heat that you need to dissipate just for the CPT stuff is about a hundred times that, right? 
That's what Warker says, and uh, the okay. CPT model needs to be revised because that's right. not going to work. Okay, so so what you're saying is that you solved about one percent of the heat problem if we take AIG's numbers. Yeah, or another way of saying it is, yeah, I mean, I suppose you could look at it that way. So, youch, that's not good. As a side note, close your eyes and listen to this next clip and tell me that David doesn't sound like Jay Burichel, who voices Hiccup in How to Train Your Dragon, which is the main thing I know him from. Limit to the amount of former mantle material, rock layers, whatever it is, that can be cooled and that can be discharged to the ocean before it's problematic. Mr. Anderson actually just continues to get zingers out of David, much to the agony, I'm assuming, of Donnie and um, and Sam. So here's the issue with Warwicker stuff, is he's thinking that we need to cool 95 kilometer depth. Um, you know, unless we have some proof that 50 kilometers beneath the ocean, it was hot and now it's cold, um, you know, we don't really need to get rid of that heat unless you can prove that. Um, that's really an area for geophysics, which is not my area of expertise, but um, I think a legitimate question could be raised as to, you know, was all this material hot and did it actually cool? And I believe that there, if you were to drill deep in the ground deeper than you've ever drilled, you're going to find higher temperatures than what you expect from a secular perspective. That's my opinion. Okay. Do you have anything to back that up or is that just an opinion that you just... That's just hold? an opinion. That's just okay, so it's got so it's got no basis in, in in science or fact. It's just something that you hope to be true. It's based on my work and realization that there's really only so much heat that can be removed during catastrophic plate tectonics, and so I believe a lot of it's still in the ground. Okay, so the only reason that you believe that that heat is still in the ground is because you don't have a way to dissipate it. Yeah, that's a good. That's a okay. very astute statement. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Wow, I didn't expect to get that from you. Okay, um... That was pretty much my attitude for, like, this entire stream. Wow, I, I didn't expect we would hear that from him, right? Uh, so Mr. Anderson sums things up quite nicely there, and I think firmly lets us know, right, that David is certainly coming from a presuppositionalist perspective. Mr. Anderson really drills down on the singular point of asking David if he is aware of any flood model out there that is capable of getting rid of the heat just using workers like 10 raised 28, 10 raised 29 joules for the friction of the plates atop the mantle, like not even looking at accelerated nuclear decay, just looking at the friction. And uh, this is what David says. Okay, and there's no other model, CT model, which generates heat that you're aware of, that you have numbers for, that your model could dissipate the heat for, right? Well, I guess that's correct, yes. Okay, all right, thanks. You I think, pretty uh, much said that. Yeah, I think that's it for me. And Donnie's response to this is unbeatable. Okay, Mr. Anderson, uh, that was good. So hearty thank you to Mr. Anderson for uh, getting all those um, little sound bites for us. That's that's lovely. I wasn't expecting any of that to happen, and um, the, the stream exceeded my wildest dreams in that light. So the last thing I really want to talk about with regard to David is a question that I asked before leaving, like the side chat. Like I, I had other stuff to do that night, and I didn't really want to hang around much longer. So I asked a question. I was like, Donnie, make sure this is asked. And then I left. And the question that I asked was essentially, why does radiometric dating seem to work? What about its predictive capabilities? How would David, being someone who doesn't do the accelerated nuclear decay, how would he explain the ancient ages and our ability to use radiometric dating to like find fossil fuels and things like that? And I'm just going to play his full response for you here because um, I think it's really good. Well, here's my kind of thoughts on radiometric dating. And I'm, um, if radiometric dating is accurate, we should see a large amount of rocks dated 4,500 years ago because we know that's about when flood happened. Yeah. We don't find that. So either one of two things is correct. Either there's something wrong with radiometric dating or the biblical timeline is incorrect. As a Christian, I can't uh, reject the biblical timeline of when the flood happened. Now, before that's another story. But, um, you know, so the flood happened at 4,500 years ago, and that's what the Bible says. As far as to why radiometric dating, as far as radiometric dating, um, I have not seen any creationist work and I've seen several that can explain why rocks that seem old aren't really old that I have found um, to be acceptable. I think I'm of the opinion that 
this radium after dating issue is a problem that the creationist community has not solved yet, as why do these rocks appear old by radium after dating when they're not actually that old? I don't think that's a problem that the creationist community has successfully resolved yet. So, I mean, I guess my answer to that question is, you know, um, did God create the world to look old? I don't know. Um, how do I deal with the predictive capabilities of radium after dating? Um, I do not have an answer to that question. Bravo, David. I concur. Now, you may be like me and you're like, oh my goodness, is Donnie going to do the thing that he always does where he just takes the guest's position because he thinks it's like the most tenable one because it's the only one that at that exact moment in time has not been like thoroughly debunked. And um, interestingly enough, Donnie had this to say in the live chat about accelerated nuclear decay. You know, that thing that he's been going on about and supporting for the past several years. Accelerated decay has happened. Okay, <laughs> That's the most important point. At Creation Myths, I don't believe accelerated decay happened. Matt and I gave a presentation on it last night. Well, oh my goodness, this is news to me. Since when, Donnie? What about this? Accelerated decay has happened. Okay, <laughs> That's the most important point. Now, of course, I'm always one for changing your mind when new information comes to light. That's good. That's important. That is a, a valuable character trait to have. But, you know, Donnie doesn't seem to really commit to any idea that he holds. He kind of just like tenuously grasps at like the most likely solution for the heat problem at that given moment, throwing caution to the wind at all the additional problems that that quote unquote solution actually provides. So like, I don't really take him very seriously on this. I don't think he's really thought very diligently about it because I would wager that he's going to be back at supporting accelerated nuclear decay before you know it. Because what are you going to do about the radiometric dates, Donnie? Uh, but obviously I had to go check out the show that him and Raw Matt did. Like, what is their alternative idea for explaining radiometric dates, if not accelerated nuclear decay. Because remember, they can say it's miraculous for the first four billion years and like all that happened during creation, but because the flood is responsible for 500 million years at least, then he's gonna have to come up with something different to explain that time frame. So w what did he say? Well, what you're seeing is a little chart that shows you that by looking uh, at these radioactive elements on the bottom over here, you can see uranium. And why it would sink to the bottom is right here. It's one of the highest in the uh, atomic mass and weight. And then the lightest are at the top, potassium, argon. And so they, during the global flood, if everything's being mixed around, what do you, where do you expect that these radioactive elements are going to be in the different layers? Well, we would expect the heaviest and most dense to be on the bottom. They just happen to be the oldest. And then the lighter ones are near the top. Yep, they've brought this old idea back out again. The one that I covered on this channel years ago that is patently absurd. So I'm just going to play my clip from that video. You remember this one? Yeah, Are unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah, where, where we see our sorting, uh, our sorting of our our um our elements by by weight. Who who would like to tackle this one first? Well, John, for one, the Earth is kind of spinning the uh, it's it's not spinning in the right configuration to work like a centrifuge, and I think you would need like a weapons grade centrifuge for this to even uh, be relevant. Well, uh, isn't. And it's hard for me to make out, but isn't he ordering it from heaviest at the bottom to lightest at the top? Yes, that looks he is. like so, you're right, so a centrifuge would do the other way. Yeah, a, a centrifuge Sorry, would have so the you, heaviest being on the outside. Right. So, so the uh, configuration of the Earth is kind of opposite. Um, and and but that's the only thing that would, how this would be relevant. Like I don't know if he legitimately doesn't know that heavy elements don't sink within a fluid; they still diffuse. For example, in the uh, the, the fluid phase of the magma or the mantle and, and it's, I, I don't know. Plus, this, if this they're is... claiming all the elements uh, were, were decaying inside the, the mantle as, as you know, Jordan covered, I would wonder how volcanic enrichment would do this. I mean, cause now, now it's having to be put back in that order. And well, here's the other, uh, the other hilarious part of this. Um, we don't date things by the amount of the, elements that are shown here it, it yeah. has to do with the isotope ratios and so things that are very old may be quite depleted in uranium uh they may be highly enriched in uranium as an example uh the, the, it just has nothing to do with the mass of the elements and, or any kind of sorting of them so that, Which, that's just yeah. yeah not even relevant well, raw mat uh okay. several times and he, he kind of talks kind of scattered over the place so it's a little hard to follow but i think he said this several times, the older uranium would be at the bottom and the newer yeah. uranium would be at the top. And it, I don't know what he pictures. Like, are we like IDing their uranium? Like, <laughs> like I, w what the hell are you talking about? No, 
it, like like you said, it's about ratios. We're looking at like there was this much uranium and it decayed into this much lead, and we can compare it and determine how long it's been since this crystal closed. You know, but that, not to mention you would never see you know you, uranium, thorium, lead, and and so forth. Uranium, lead, for example, plotting along a Concordia, you would never find mm-hmm. uh, uranium thorium systems in concordance with lutetium, hafnium, and samarium, neodymium, and uh, strontium, uh, rubidium these other isotopic systems, but they are frequently um, found in concordance. That's kind of the default that, that we find. And, and the this, exception is when we find discordance. This also simply doesn't make sense in the context of a few different, like, like isolated specific examples of, of geology and physics, et cetera. It's like, this doesn't mesh with what we find at Oklo. This doesn't mesh with, with gastroliths in, in the bodies of dinosaurs. It, it creates so many different problems with all of the other corroborative methods that we use to cross-check against radiometric dating, because then all of those have to have mechanisms that make them look like they corroborate radiometric dating when they really yeah. don't. Yeah, and let's let's not forget that it's um, insane. let's not forget that the mantle is uh, quite depleted in all of these elements. They are <laughs> incompatible, and they are enriched in the crust, like in especially in igneous and metamorphic crustal rocks. They are further enriched often. Uh, in sedimentary rocks, uh, in terrestrial systems, you know, in seawater and, and freshwater systems. Uh, so it's not like, yeah, it's it's kind of an opposite um, opposite to reality figure. And like I said, even if you take their model, even if you accept it, right, like just, just try to, to run it through and see if it's even internally consistent. They want to talk all the time about how these heavy elements are going to sink. So they, they think it's kind of like you're throwing a rock in the water or something like that. And that, that's yeah. the only factor. Okay, cool. So heavy elements sink. Okay. But at the same time, heavy elements also are selectively raised up because it's not enough to just extrude the magma to the surface and make a new crust or whatever after your flood because that crust has to be enriched now, right? That's what he's saying. Like it used to not be enriched because all the all the stuff was down below, but now it is enriched, right? So, and we're doing it through volcanoes. So the volcano, somehow there has to be some mechanism to selectively choose heavier elements to push up. Well, if, 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 if heavy elements are selectively pushed up, they wouldn't sink. Like it doesn't... <laughs> It doesn't it's even not, internally make sense. Right. That I was going to say, it's not internally consistent with itself. But I, and, and I know this is like a low dig, but I don't know what else we expect from someone who, who doesn't know what a half-life is. Like, again, this, this was being presented by a member of that panel who botched the definition of a half-life. Like, that's what you learn in like, in like eighth grade you know, for earth science or whatever. It's it's not a difficult concept to understand. And these are the individuals who are overturning the paradigm. So all of that just still holds, right? Like the diagram is the same. The explanation is the same. We're dealing with the same silly idea and it still doesn't work. In fact, I think you could just apply that to the global flood. You could apply that to young earth creationism. It's the same silly idea and it still doesn't work work. I think it's extremely telling that all of the efforts at solving the heat problem have ended in not just regular failure, but like relatively embarrassing failure. And um, while it is enjoyable to cover, I certainly hope that eventually the Standing for Truth channel will come around to what was always going to be their fate in all of this, which is, yeah, unknown physics or a miracle. Like, they're more and more sympathetic every time they switch to a new idea, like, oh, maybe it's this, but it could be a miracle, or maybe it's this, but it could be a miracle, right? Just just say it's a miracle, you guys, come on. Like, you basically already said it. Still, it's always a delight to pop into a Standing for Truth live stream where he's covering a topic and just watch the guest annihilate him better than really anyone else could have, and all right before my eyes. I just thought this would be a fun video, right? Like, it's always good to check in on the heat problem. It's easy content, and it's also almost always fun content, right? Like, I get to use a lot of jokes and memes and things like that, and you guys seem to enjoy it as well. So, my gentle and, of course, very modern apes, I hope you had fun with this as well. If you like what I do, please consider supporting me in the free way, which is just liking, commenting, and subscribing. Even silly comments are (laughs) helpful for the algorithm. And if you want to support me in greater ways, you can join my Patreon, right? Patrons get early access to videos sometimes, but they are having early access to the brand new animation, which is going to be coming out shortly, perhaps for some kind of like special landmark occasion that's coming up for this channel. 
you should check out my subscriber number and tell other people to subscribe if, if they haven't already. And if you haven't subscribed, the sooner you do, the sooner you can see the new animation for free, as well as a boatload of other cool things that are coming to this channel. Um, and so, my gentle and of course very modern apes, I'll see you guys real soon next time. Thank you.